You're done with your Oreo? <laughs> yeah, I'm done with my Oreo. Okay, good. Um, do we really know what happened? The brother did. The brother, that's what I thought too. I mean, that seems like kind of obvious. Hey, do you want to talk about death? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just a murdery thing. Yes. Wait, that was terrible. Here yes! we go. Yes! Yeah. T- Do, <laughs> doing it. Yeah. I Team don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Mystery. Team Mystery strikes again. Another second Wednesday. Team Mystery. <laughs> Welcome to Mystery Murder Thingy. Welcome to Mystery Murder Thingy. My name is Chloe. <laughs> My name is Mario. And thank you for... <laughs> <laughs> No, we're not supposed to say where we work. We don't work where, huh? <laughs> Who? I'll Can you out. take that out? Yeah, I'll just go. It's just... in the very beginning. I wonder if I could bleep, if I could like bleep it. That would be funny. I probably won't go to the trouble. Haven't anyway, we talked about it before? You know what? Moving it's on. It's funny though because we we like don't edit the episodes now unless something like that happens. I know. Where <laughs> there's like rare instances where we're like, okay, let's actually cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> not like as a joke, but like really, <laughs> not too often. Like if though. I go, if I start singing any Disney song, it's like they're gonna come after you. <laughs> they are dicks about it. We couldn't do Disney theme at work because Disney. I know because which is so backwards, Disney. right? I don't know. I, it's, it's so they can have money to produce their wonderful live events, like the wonderful world of Disney, The Little Mermaid. It was, it was like. It was okay. It was like a was five a, out of like ten. Okay. If y'all watched The Little Mermaid live on ABC last night. We happened to catch it. It was, yeah, we got lucky. It was like 15 minutes before. Right. We were like, oh yeah, that's going to be on. Let's watch but, it. But uh, it was about a solid five out of ten. <laughs> it was It was pretty uneven. Um, it was very uneven. Shaggy was terrible. I don't know if we want to get into like a full review. Yeah. Shaggy was not very good. Shaggy was bad. Queen Latifah uh, nailed Queen it. Queen Latifah was amazing. Amazing. Um, John, uh, uh, John Stamos. John Stamos. Was, he was solid. pretty good. He was pretty good. Who else was in a five? He was better than a five. And then, of course... Uh, Oli Cravalho. I don't know how to say right. her name. What, however you say it. Oli. Uh, Oli. It's like Cravalho. A-U-L-I apostrophe I. Right. You said she's like... Native she's Latin, like, or Native Hawaiian, right? She's when she she was fifteen when she played Moana. Right. I think she was. And 15. whoever she was it was, I don't know his name. Whoever played Prince Eric, he, he did was so great. good. He, he was, was probably the best. He was probably the best one. Yeah, because he was consistently good. Yeah. Okay, this is like way more bullshitting than we usually do. So anyway, <laughs> now that we're two and a half minutes in, um, I'm gonna go first this week because um, we already decided. Yes, Yeet. yes, right, right. And I'm going to do another medical mystery because I felt like doing another medical mystery. Um, that's why I told you two, two weeks ago. Oh, it's wow. been oh, it's been such a fortnight since then. Fortnight means two weeks. Uh. I don't know if you if you knew that. Um, you told me that the other day. Sorry. Oh yeah, somebody somebody said it. I think when we You're were watching me this Netflix. Look like what the fuck are you saying that? For? We're watching Netflix. <laughs> yeah. It was not. That was. I was supposed to be an inside joke, but it was just me. Oh. I was the only one who got it. That happens a lot for me. Okay, so I'm gonna do, <laughs> right. So I'm gonna do rare diseases. So that's my mystery for this week. And and uh, Chloe, I think your first question when I told you what I was gonna do, and and maybe the listeners at home's first question as well is, is there really a mystery here? Like, it, what's the mystery? Yeah. You know. And I would say there are many, many mysteries that, in fact, like some of the mysteries I've covered before, and I've I've said this before. I think it kind of makes sense to think of this as like a universe of mysteries. A There's... universe of mysteries. Right, right. Because you know they're... what? That would have been such a better podcast name. Oh, yeah. That really would have. The universe of mysteries. If only we had a time machine. Where's the doctor? I know. It's not Stewie. how it works. <laughs> right, where's Stewie? Um, so, okay. but the So there are many mysteries at many different levels, right? If, I think if, if, you, if you start to think about it. But the central ones are the mysteries that you know, confront the the, pa- the patients, the people, right, who suffer from these rare, um, or what are sometimes called orphan diseases. God, that must be terrible. Right. Like, I mean, no one, not even the doctor, knows. Exactly. And this is, it's so common. It comes up p- pretty much every time you ever hear about people who suffer from rare diseases. They have this, ex- like, common experience where they have an extended period where just like you're saying, um, well, and sometimes not only what they have, sometimes whether they are even 
truly suffering from a, a, from a condition that named or disease. Rare it's, disease. Yeah. Or, or any disease at all. Because they're like, oh, doctors, that disease is rare. That's probably not what you have. Right. Or doctors just tell them they don't have anything, that they're making it up, that it's literally in their head. That's yeah, that up. happens not infrequently. And yeah, it's pretty messed up. Like, your doctor trying to gaslight you because they don't know what you have, essentially. It's it's crazy. Um, and not the only, obviously, tragedy or failing in, the, in all of these systems that we'll talk about, right? Like, that's a big part of this. Um, so anyway, in a sense, there are millions upon hundreds of millions, right, of, of individual mysteries that surround these rare diseases. So that's that's kind of what I, I guess, mean when I say a universe of diseases or of mysteries, but diseases as well, because there's like thousands of them. Um, and we'll get into a few more sort of particular human examples of, you know, what's ha what's happening here. Um, but let's start with some just kind of like some basics, right? Some context, like what is a rare disease, right? What is what does that even mean? Um, which in itself is kind of a mystery because they're is no one definition of what a rare disease is. It's, it's pretty contextual, um, which makes sense, I guess, if you think about it. So, for example, a, a disease or condition that's rare in the United States might be very prevalent in another country, right, or vice versa, um, or, or even within populations within one country. So it's rare amongst some people, but common amongst other people. Um, and, you know, therefore, you know, the rarity of it is, is like sort of, like I said, contextual. So um, one, one thing also is that rare but innocuous conditions aren't usually included when people talk about rare diseases. So you might have some genetic, you know, mutation that is, ex you might be the only person in the whole world who has it, but it does nothing. No one ever knows about it. It never comes up. That's not technically a rare disease, right? It's a... It's, hmm. it's just a rare condition, you know, okay. or something. So they, you know, just for statistical purposes and things, they don't, they don't really like focus on that. Okay. It doesn't really matter. I probably shouldn't even have mentioned it. I've been going on way too long about it. Continue. I continue. So, um, another reason why this is, this kind of like these semantic things kind of come into play, right. Is because governments, right. And other organizations have to come up with solid legal definitions, right. When you write a law, you're like supposed to make it accurate, right? As much as you can, but they tend to, although you know, like uh, one solid number, they're kind of arbitrary, right? So, for example, in the U.S., according to Wikipedia, quote, the Rare Diseases Act of 2002 defines mm -hmm. rare disease strictly according to prevalence, specifically any disease or condition that affects fewer than 200,000 people in the United States or about 1 in 1,500 okay. people, close okay. quote. In Japan, they set the market about 1 in 2,500 people. In Europe, it's like generally 1 in 2,000 people. Um, there are different medical experts and texts that peg it anywhere between 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 200,000 people, you know, in terms of how you define a rare disease. Or it seems like it varies by population. And it's exactly. And then that's another factor. Well, amongst what population are we talking right. about? You know, is it just Americans? Is it people in the Western Hemisphere? Is, is it, you know, um, whatever subset you want to talk about? But all of this, you know, somewhat misses the the paradox. I think that, that it's it, I read this and I was like, oh, of course that eat, while each individual condition or disease is truly rare, taken collectively, quote-unquote, rare diseases are not that rare. They're fairly common. According to the Genetic and Rare Diseases Information Center, there may be as many as 7,000 rare diseases. But again, that itself is a mystery because no one's really tracking it or, or collating those, those like, data. Um, and that, and they affect approximately 25 to 30 million Americans at any given time. Right. And of course, if you're talking worldwide, you know, it's order, it's order of magnitude bigger than that. So it's a lot of people. They're, they're not really rare, rare diseases taken collectively are more prevalent than other more well-known diseases. Um, so anyway, uh, according to the rare disease community as well, this is kind of numbers remain stable for many decades. So when trying to solve the mystery of just how many rare diseases th there are, how many people they affect, kind of these basic questions, right? One 
also runs into what I was kind of hinting at earlier, the kind of age-old problem of bad record keeping. Like, we don't know because no one's bothering to find out, essentially, mm. uh, to some extent, for some of these things. Most rare diseases are not required to be tracked in the United States, and so they're not generally tracked. Um, people don't really usually do those things unless you make them, unfortunately. And there seems to be not enough. There's just not enough. Right. Research, right. people, records. Exactly. Studies. Some of that stuff has gotten better in recent years. Some of it not as much. Um, now, one kind of exception to this is that rare diseases in children, especially very young children... Um, are more highly monitored. And rare diseases do tend to crop up more in the very young and the very old. Okay, um, well, yeah. Right. Um, for Some of them there are developmental diseases and things of that nature, so it's sort of natural um, in a sense. So uh, this isn't to say also, you know, all of this sort of gloom and doom that I'm talking about, right, that there, that there isn't in a lot of information out there. There's a ton of information out there about all of and any of these diseases that if you want to dive into, you can go on and on and on. Um, you can check that information out at places like rarediseases.info.nih.gov. Okay, okay. And that's the Rare Disease Information Center I was talking about earlier. So that's a, a U.S. government website. Um, or orpha.net. That's O-R-P-H-A.net. What does that stand for? Uh, orphan diseases. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so... It's um, another um, kind of a medical resource, really. But, I mean, if you know someone who may have one of these diseases or things like that, you can go there, find resources, find information. Um, good, solid, you know, scientific information. Okay, so now that we're done with kind of the context part, let's pivot to some of these individual stories that I found in my research, Ooh. of which there are so many. Um, so many that I'm going to do more two weeks from now. Ooh! Um, and and those will be a, a, a little bit different. All of these are it, get very particular. Yeah. So um, we found is doing more in depth research that there's like right. oh there's so much more. There's there's so much more. more. There's always more. <laughs> more more always uh. more. Feed um, me Seymour. Okay, sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. So uh, that's Disney. Um, oh we, no. We weren't technically singing. It was just mentioning the name of it. Um, don't sue us. Disney. Please don't. Please. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I found some of these, you know, individual compelling, you know, stories that kind of highlight the human cost and uh, just the pure sort of unsolvability, if that's a word, of the mysteries that surround rare diseases. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about, the first one's kind of short and the second one's kind of long. So just to kind of understand that. Um, so the first one is about uh, Tess and Tess... Um, it's a very young patient suffering from a rare disease. Uh, and like I said, unfortunately, that happens a lot. Is that her real name? Yeah. Just Tess? Well, Tess and then her last name. I didn't write the last names down for this one for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so Tess and her parents, Bo and Kate. So it's Tess, Bo and Kate. Okay. Um, and uh, like I said, a good proportion of rare disease patients, um, Tess is rare genetic disorder in her case manifested very early in her life. This is around 2010. And uh, Tess's disorder was really difficult to diagnose. Um, like we, you know, sort of harped on earlier, right? It's it, it comes up every time. But in her case, it was really, really hard to diagnose. Um, and eventually, her mom, Kate, um, who is herself a gastroenterologist, mm. um, you know, after she had gone to so many doctors, right, done so many tests, um, took to the internet and wrote a blog, like a heartfelt blog post, mm -hmm. um, it said, and, um, you know, made some connections through that, um, you know, kind of uh, blog post documenting her family's experience. In fact, she got a response the very next day mm. uh, from a researcher at Baylor University, and uh, soon tests had been diagnosed. At, at wow. least that was solved. And it turned out that she had this exceedingly rare genetic um, mutation known as USP7. And she was, at the time, only the eighth known patient. Wow. Yeah. So just, you know, essentially a handful. Um, so that particular mystery solved, Tess, you know... Um, and her parents had to confront the sort of larger and much more ominous mystery of 
the fact that there's no cure to USP7, yeah. which is, again, another um, sort of whole part, you know, uh, world of mysteries in and of itself, right? If I can extend this metaphor. Um, because rare diseases sort of, you know, almost of necessity are very hard to cure and typically don't have a cure. So what what cures these diseases is also sort of a central mystery here, right? That kind of runs throughout all of this. Um, but, you know, in, in uh, sort of, you know, particularize it to Tess and her uh, situation, they were um, sort of trying to, you know, navigate this confusing world, right? What is USP7, you know, genetic mutations? I mean, like I said, her mom was a gastroenterologist, but she wasn't a genetic researcher. Right. Um, so, you know... They they kind of found their way and and made connections with other people and and uh, one of those people was uh, this guy named Daniel DeFabio and uh, Daniel's son suffers from uh, what's called Mencus disease and uh, Daniel had made a film to sort of raise awareness about you know Mencus disease and and uh, his son and to find connections right um, which is so so vital here um, with all of this so. Um, he convinced Tess's parents um, to also make a film about their experience, and um, that's actually how I found their their story on like a a review of that or a story about that um, whole thing. So eventually, or it was about the film festival actually. So eventually, they made this whole film festival called Disorder, the Rare Disease Film Festival. Ooh, yeah. And it's, it seems really interesting. They had, like, do- dozens of entries, even the first year. It's been going since 2017. Um, I know at least they did it 2017 and last year. I'm not sure if they did it this year or not. I, I'm not sure if I saw that. But um, through efforts like those, dozens more USP7 patients have been diagnosed and identified um, up to about 52. So what does that mean? I don't know what USP7... USP7, it's a genetic mutation. So, so is she like what are her symptoms? Um I I didn't write down all the symptoms but it's I'm sorry. <laughs> I I I looked at it but I I don't I remember super well right now. But it's it's a, a developmental disorder essentially. Okay. So it it um um you know uh Made so it more difficult she... for her to f- physically develop. I'm not does sure if it's mental physical... development as well. I'm okay, not sure. okay, okay. I think it's mostly the physical physical development, okay. as I recall. Okay. Proteins were involved. I remember prions. The word, the word protein. <gasps> no, not no prions. Oh, those but, are scary. Um, I always call them prions. I know. Um, I don't think so. Those anyway. freak me out. But yeah, if you guys want to learn about prions. <laughs> P R I O N S. Go to I don't know um, how you say it. This podcast will kill you. It's oh a great yeah, podcast. Well, good. Yeah, shout out. Right, and like I was saying before, you know, this whole you know making a movie, the film festival, making friends, making connections, make raising awareness. Right, it's sort of a buzzword, but with rare diseases, it 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 takes on just a whole different level of importance. You know, when when there are so few people who have it, um, unfortunately, finding a cure. It's a, a profit-driven business, right? Just like anything else. And without many known patients, and without stories about you, without the press, you know, putting your your disease out there, your name out there, um, there just isn't that much incentive to try. You know, to try know, to find cures. Yeah, there's um, not much motivation there either. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I guess it. I mean, that's why a lot of it's so sad. It's just kind of hopeless sometimes. And I'm sure it seems that way to the, you know, to the people suffering it. You know, I cannot imagine at all what they're going through um, in in all of these cases, you know. And, um, you know, my my mom had her own path to getting diagnosed that took a long time. Um, Not not for what she's suffering from now, but with with her um, or not just with that, but with with other things, too. So, you know, it's it's just when. When I say embrace the mystery, that's... I don't want to embrace that mystery. That's a mystery I'll make an exception for, you know. Um, we should... Those should all be solved, um, one would hope. But what what, what helps to do that is um, that more and more rare disease patients and their advocates have been creating these organizations that unite the cause of many of the sufferers of, of all of these diseases, right, to come to band together and to together create um enough awareness and and visibility um you know sort of to put them on par with the other more fashionable diseases 
it's sort of crass to put it that way, but it's it. That's sort of the way the world works. I'm sorry. I mean, I, it, yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough and it sucks and it's not fair. But I don't know. That's how it is. I think. Um, I mean, it's a moral. It's a moral thing. Like, do we save? Do we focus on hundreds of thousands of people that have this right. disease, or do you focus on the two? You know, Which, and and I'll talk about this a little more next time, but. Um, I'll, there is also a um, maybe I'll do this at the beginning of the next episode. There is a, a specific government program in the U.S. at least, and probably in other countries, um, that is meant to like give these people another option. When no one else will diagnose you, you go here, and they do yeah. everything, and then ten percent more that no one else knows about, and people get diagnosed. Um, so it's, I, I don't want to leave people with the impression that there's no hope in any of this, that it's completely bleak and whatever. Um, but anyway. Also the internet. Yeah, exactly. And the internet can be, it can, it's a double-edged sword, right? But for, for a lot of these people, it's a lifeline. Okay. Um, so now the, my second story, uh, individual story in here. Um, and this one, we're talking about, you know, connections, making connections, how, critical that is. And this one, as with some other of these cases and, and another one I'll talk about next week or next time, um, it's, it's a lot harder to make those connections because the possible cause of your rare disease is a sort of unfortunate truth to people in power. And, and we'll, we'll get into it here. So this is the case, um, or a case that centers around the legendary Los Alamos facility in, in New Mexico, where they made the bomb. The bonds, the develop the bomb, Oppenheimer, you know, Richard okay. Feynman, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and a man who worked there, not back then, but much more recently, named Chad Wald. And by the time Chad died of a glioblastoma on June 28th of 2017, he had been working proudly at Los Alamos for over 15 years. Wow. And in that time, he had climbed the ranks by being diligent, dependable, and most of all, safety-minded. And it's, I think, a tragic irony then um, that the very same superiors who promoted and praised Chad due to his consci conscientiousness may themselves have contributed to his death through their negligence. And I'll, I'll get into what I mean. Allegedly, of course. And I know that's a big, a big claim. Um, but according to the reporting of Rebecca Moss at the Santa Fe, uh, Santa Fe New Mexican, uh, who, who detailed the story in a long-form article, there were uh, systemic and persistent problems with the safety protocol at Los Alamos, including during the time when, when Chad was working there, uh, starting in um, late 1999, early 2000. So um, apparently these issues are also not confined just to Los Alamos in, in terms of you know, research facilities, Department of Energy, you know, type facilities. Um, and here's a, a quote from that article by uh, Rebecca Moss, quote, falsified radiation data or medical records have been documented at other labs. Los Alamos has not been fined for willful falsification of health records, but it has been cited within the past year for serious safety violations, close quote. So, and, and, you know, part of it also is, and we'll get into this a lot more, the record keeping surrounding that, you know, there's talk about how, well, they haven't been fined, you know, but it's not necessarily the case that everything comes out and there are people yeah. who seem to be maybe trying to cover some things up. Maybe. Allegedly. Why? Because it's, it's very unfortunate when your, you know, nuclear research facility is killing its workers. That doesn't look very good. That's not going to help you as the person who runs it. I mean, I think it's natural yeah. to, to see why they would want to deny these things, but that's no excuse. So the guy who was working there for 15 years and he died, was it due to a... How did he die? Well, we'll, we'll get into that. Okay, that's sort okay, of, that's okay, sort okay. Of the my mystery. bad, my bad. No, 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 that's okay, that's okay. That, you, you, you've... Found the nut of the question there, the but nut. it's Ew. it's uh, it is a mystery. So I'm not sure you'll we'll, we're we're not we necessarily going to get to a solid answer. answer. Yes. Exactly, exactly. It's not going to be a satisfying story by any means. Um, kind of like laugh for you know cry right. So anyway, I know. Um, I know. God. I know it's so sad. So anyway, um, part of um, so so well, one thing you need to understand is this: these little tabs called dosimeters. Okay, 
So these little tabs, and this is part of the safety protocols I was talking about. So these are little, um, you know, indicators that the workers are supposed to wear when they, you know, work at these types of facilities, uh, again called a dosimeter, and it's meant to record the amount of radiation that they're receiving. And it's supposed to be strictly tracked, and if someone exceeds the allotment, that person is supposed to be moved to another job where they don't have the exposure until a certain amount of time or whatever. Like, it's all calculated out. However, this protocol doesn't seem to have been adhered to um, for, you know, oh, and geez. a lot of this time. You know, who knows? But according to some, the readings were not tracked and the workers were not reassigned. Essentially, they just, like, di they had the dosimeters for some people, most people maybe, mm. um, kind of depended, it seemed like. Um, but it's not like, they didn't really, like, do the follow-up or the follow-through that they were supposed to do to really help these people, right? That's and that's, again, up. what it comes down to, right? If you're a worker at that facility and you're getting too large of a dose of radiation, you know, you're supposed to, that's supposed to be in your medical records. You're right. supposed to be put into a program that they specifically set up for health monitoring for people who had too high a dose of radiation. So when they're not doing that, they're intentionally putting those people in harm's way. Yeah. Just. It, for why? To make another buck? Time? I, I don't, I don't like, know. I don't... For, for convenience? Because the, I don't know, but. Just the fact that it happens at all makes me extremely angry. Yeah. Um, it's it's as very, you can probably hear it's in my very voice. like, um, senseless. It's very. Yeah, it is senseless. Um, and it's, yeah. So, anyway, um, furthermore, there may have been, uh, I wrote that in my write up there. Furthermore, it's a good, it's a good transition, right? Okay. All okay, right. Good, good. Yes. Um, correct. For, <laughs> furthermore, there may have been instances in which the leadership refused to record accurate decimeter readings. For example, when Chad's decimeter showed an unusually high amount of radiation exposure at one point in 2008, the leadership tried to tell him he must have sent his decimeter through an x-ray machine or something. <laughs> Even though Chad hadn't gone through any x-ray machines... <laughs> He hadn't recently been in an airport or anything like that had happened. And, do airports and have more radiation? Clearly, he would never do that. Well, you run your things through an x-ray machine. Oh, oh, wow. That went right over my head. But, <laughs> like, he's not an idiot. Like, yeah. He Even if he had been to an airport, like, he still he wouldn't have done that. Right, right. Because his dosimeter would have been somewhere else. Like, not with it. It's just so dumb. Um, but this this was what they said. And... Yeah, it's kind of funny, but they didn't put it in his records. They just erased it, acted like it never happened. Essentially, like he was making it up. They kind of reprimanded him, actually, for having this high radiation reading. Again, it's frustrating and maddening. Um, however, while he hadn't gone through an airport x-ray recently, or his things hadn't at least... Um, Chad had been working at Technical Area 53 on the Los Alamos um, grounds, which houses a research accelerator capable of emitting the kind of radiation mm -hmm. that would create the re readings there that were found is. in his decimeter. Now, of course, who's to say what actually happened? It's completely a mystery and always will be, um, just because things, again, weren't tracked, weren't recorded. But... It's that's another possibility. All, or maybe he forgot he ran his stuff through an X-ray, right? <laughs> you got your face. You're like, oh. Christ. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so, uh, like I said, reports of this incident and others as well were not documented in Chad's personnel records as they clearly should have been. Um, of course, Chad and his family didn't find this out until after his tragic diagnosis, which happened in 2014. After experiencing um, a, a health episode at work, uh, Chad was given a CT scan, and um, his diagnosis came pretty quickly after that, um, or immediately afterwards. And when he was um, told that he had a mass growing in his brain, oh, God. Chad's wife Angela said he cried for only the second time ever in front of her. Um, the only other time being his mother's funeral. Oh, wow. So, it's always devastating, right? I mean... Also very existential. Right. I mean, the question of death, what happens after death, 
you know, what's going to happen done that. to me. It's your whole entire world is just like... Had this discussion, you know. <laughs> but to, oh to really contemplate no more me. Move on. Anyway. It's all just too much. Too um, much. Like... Uh, but like Tessa's family, you know, while they had solved that part of the mystery, right, a, l- a larger part of the mystery remained. Um, now, Chad did have pathways for treatment, and he pursued those aggressively over the next, right. you know, three years that he would have left. Um, but they could not say for sure why that glioblastoma had developed in Chad's brain. Um, because ultimately, one can really never, almost never, say for sure why any cancer develops. That's just sort of the nature of cancer and our level of understanding of what cancer is and how it works. Um, We're just not that good. You know, unraveling the origins of, um, you know, Chad's glioblastoma was just like probably never going to really happen. But it had to kind of, it had to kind of happen. At, in some sense, um, not just for his, you know, peace of mind, but because it would determine whether he qualified for federal aid. Uh, mm. So again, when the government's involved, you got things have to be particular. Um, and it's, you know, known that glioblastoma is a rarer form of cancer, um, you know, especially for people at Chad's age, around 40. Um, again, usually happens in people who are either much younger or much older than him. Um, however, it is one of the rare cancers found in a much higher prevalence among the victims of atomic bomb blasts and radioactive fallout. So, again, the kind of radiation that one would be exposed to at, you know, a radia- you know, a, a facility that deals in radiation when things are not properly handled. Um, which is, that's, that's kind of the, the mystery like here, so right? Did that happen or not? Me. Yeah. So anyway, um... As such, glioblastoma is one of the diagnoses, uh, diagnoses generally considered promising for funding under the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act, which um, I can't remember when they passed that exactly. I think it was in like two, the 2000s or something. So, um, but of course, you know, they're not just going to say like, oh, you got this diagnosis, so you get the money. Um, unless you worked there before 1996. That's what the law Come said. On. And again, it's it's this one arbitrary year, right? Um, because the Department so of Energy... did he work? No, he didn't. He started working there in 1999. Oh, Jesus. Three years later. So, so this whole thing about 1996, right? The Department of Energy admits that the records were not well kept and the conditions were not good before 1996. But after 1996, things were cleaned up. They were totally fine. That's them talking, not me. So just so it's clear. So Chad, who started in, like I said, 1999, would have to prove his case to the government um, in order to get the, you know, the the money that... That's a whole other, like, step of stress. Yeah, exactly. Not only are you dealing with this horrible disease that you're dealing with, you're dealing with the fucking U.S. government <laughs> and whether they're going to give you money to help you or not. shit healthcare system. It's, and our crazy bonkers doesn't make a lick of fucking sense healthcare system. God. Anyway, we probably shouldn't start talking about the American <laughs> health care. We're going to go on for like hours. <laughs> so anyway, um, the decision on whether it was likely enough that Chad's glioblastoma was, you know, essentially the fault, if you want to say it that way, right, of the Los Alamos facility would be made by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. NIOSH. OSHA. Oh. NIOSH. That's the Occupational and Safety, safety Hazard. Ed, or, hazard? Or, I don't, I don't even Associ- know. Administration. <laughs> I said OSHA, and you said... There are so many... <laughs> NIOSH. Yeah. It's actually NIOSH. I didn't which even... sounds made up, but it's not. <laughs> it's like on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, sometimes <laughs> they just like make up departments. <laughs> it sounds like that, but it's a real thing. <laughs> And it's actually super serious because they decide if you get your cancer funding or not. That's so, yeah, it's actually, it's pretty fucking serious, actually, oh as I'm God. still laughing. Um, so to make that determination, <sighs> Niosh would rely on evidence. It's, it's okay. I'm sorry. We're, I'm we're sorry. like most of the way through. 
Niosh would rely on evidence from Chad's records. Now, okay. as we've been talking oh, about this yeah. whole time, and I think oh, I've set this up well, shit. you should have a sinking feeling in your stomach right I, now. Yeah. Because, of course, the records were spotty, to be kind. They only showed any unusually high radiation exposure for three of the 17 years that Chad worked there. For most years, there was just nothing. They didn't track anything for the first year plus that he worked there. Chad knew this wasn't right. I, you, We all know this isn't right, right? Especially because he knew that he got a big dose, um, probably, of radiation just after he started working at Los Alamos, during a time where it showed nothing. In May 2000, what was supposed to be a controlled burn by the National Park <gasps> Service, which they do all the time, yeah. got out of control. Yeah. Horribly, horribly out of control. And eventually consumed large parts, like 45% of the Los Alamos facility. Oh my god. Now, Chad was initially sent home as a non-essential you know, worker. Um, but meanwhile, the, for two weeks, the fire raged through you know, thousands of acres surrounding the facility and the facility itself, um, perhaps consuming many combustible, noxious, and radioactive substances that are there at the Los Alamos facility. Um, now, firefighters did describe seeing very weirdly colored fire which is an indication, right, of some kind of chemical burning, right? Um, and officials, but officials claimed that the radiation, that there was no radiation risk at all, that they did readings, that there wasn't, there weren't high levels of radiation, um, and anyway, you know, the they, really dangerous mm -hmm. stuff would be underground or in fireproof concrete tankers, like essentially nothing to see here. Don't worry about it. They said they did readings. That's what they said. I uh, assume they did, but I don't know. I I am in Where? no way positioned to, to like <laughs> gauge the accuracy of any of that. Um, nor were experts who looked into it right afterwards because they said essentially there wasn't enough evidence. So there were readings done, but they may not have been enough to really again remains a mystery. What exactly was released in those you know, days of fire remains very much a mystery. Days of fire. Days of Fire. I thought that was a good phrasing, right? Yeah. Pretty good. Um, pretty, pretty, sorry, uh, keep pretty, going. Uh, pretty good. So what's certain, though, is that when Chad returned to work two weeks later, quote, the air was still hazy with smoke when Chad and the maintenance crews were brought in to check the safety of the buildings. Oh, the walls were coated with ash, making the hallways look like tunnels, close quote. Mm. Yeah. So just how much radiation Chad experienced um, in those days will always remain a mystery since he and other workers were not issued decimeters as they should have been. He so didn't, there weren't he didn't any... get a decimeter until way later. So there weren't any records for those people either. Nope. Wow. Or a lot of other people, as we'll, we'll talk about as well. Um, I mean, I'm just going to mention one other, but it, this is a wider spread problem at Los Alamos, obviously, right? Um, like I said, experts who studied it afterwards couldn't come to any solid conclusion about what had happened. Um, and of course, you know, to get back to the NIOSH thing, they were not looking at this because it wasn't in the records. It just as it was as if it had never happened. And in the end, NIOSH established that Chad's total dose um, was 0.254 rems. I'm assuming that means like over, you know, um, 20... Like, um, over the 17 years, 20, that's like average, I guess. 25%? Per year. 0.2, am I right? No, 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 it's or not a percentage. That, oh, it's, it's not? No. So one REM equals a CT scan. Okay. It's, it's you know, so what, I guess one, you know, it's... What so they were said those was, records right? No, obviously not. Because I was going to say... No, no. So just for some context, um, the 0.254 REMs, it's a little less than a normal person would experience over that time period. Okay. So what they were saying essentially was, which He's again fine. doesn't make any sense, that Chad, who worked as a safety and maintenance expert at a nuclear research facility, received less radiation exposure than a normal person just walking around. That's right. Like truth tested, doesn't make any fucking sense. Oh, and of course, this also didn't seem quite right to Chad, who, according to his own recollection of what had transpired over those seventeen years. 
It clearly should have been more. Yeah. Uh, clearly. So, but according to Niosh, there was only a 2.67% chance, very exact, but how precise is it, that Chad's glioblastoma was related to his work at Los Alamos. So they, of course, denied his claim. Oh, God. And to, as far as I know, to this day, neither he nor his family have received any assistance from the government, um, monetary assistance. Not not that I read about in the article, at least. So, um, like we were talking about, Chad is also not the only Los Alamos worker to experience similar, you know, something similar. Um, but, again, it's a little hard to find out. Um, you know, they're denying a lot of these claims from the workers, um, you know, especially since that 90, 1996 year, right? Um, but by its very nature... The work at Los Alamos is pre is pretty secret, right? Um, Chad, at some points, was sort of hesitant to even fully tell the insurance company what he was involved in, yeah. um, for fear that he would betray his top secret clearance that he had to have to work there. So he happened to also just know another worker who became mysteriously ill. Um, that worker's records were also pretty spotty when they looked into it, and his claim was also denied. Even if the records had been perfect, it's it's still just so hard to make definitive conclusions when it comes to, to these rare diseases. Of uh, th That's maybe the most confounding mystery of all, is why? Why did this happen to me? You know, sometimes you can say it's an inherited genetic mutation, perhaps, but for almost all of these, you know, it's it's almost a futile question, but one that some of these people have to answer to the government about. Which is a whole tragedy in and of itself, My God. obviously. So, um, for Chad and Bleak. his his family, the mystery obviously continues. Um, and I'll give his wife, Angela, the final word. Quote, I probably am out of luck because they don't have a lot of information on brain cancer. I do wonder. I wonder if he hadn't worked at Los Alamos, if he would still be here. Close quote. Wow. And I think if anything, that encapsulates the 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 mystery here right it's the, this one person just like all she can do is is wonder you know embrace you the can. mystery yeah and and maybe that helps too you know maybe for some of these people embracing the mystery as opposed to trying to solve the mystery sometimes that's all you can do yeah especially in the stories we tell you know they it often ends up that way so like i said i'm going to do more of these next week we're going to get into like I said, some maybe some more hopeful stuff. We're going to talk about environmental justice. You know, that plays into a lot of these rare, rare like with everything we look into, it it always goes deeper and wider than we ever imagine. And we find like all of these different stories connected to all these different things. So I'll keep going on with uh, with the with that next time. Just Let about. Me, oh, sorry. Go yeah, go do sources. your sources. Yes. Okay, sorry. I, I saw you jumping in there. Um, so my sources: Rebecca Moss at the Santa Fe um, New Mexican. Um, of course, I found some of these on longform.org, including some of the ones I'm going to talk about next week. Um, Cancer.org, USP7.org, uh, Larry Dobro at MM and M, Genetic and Rare Diseases Information Center, like I said, part of the National Institutes of Health, uh, Wikipedia, the Rare Disease and Undiagnosed Disease Network pages, nice. uh, Orpha, OrphaNet, uh, Sean Captain at uh, Fast Company. And uh, Gina Colada at New York Times. And said, if you're looking for resources, cancer.org, great resource for anything having to do with cancer, um, and Orphanet, and uh, the Genetic and Rare Diseases Info Center. So lots more info out there. For anybody who wanted to know tests as symptoms, oh. this is from portlandrootsmedia.com. And it's just really quick. Um, uh her eyes were having trouble, <clears throat> excuse me, her eyes were having trouble telling her brain what she sees. Mm. Uh, she had trouble walking. Her hips were out of whack. It was hard to stand. Um, she had issues with digestion. She didn't talk much. Um, just a few. Mm. That's just the kind wow. of stuff. Yeah. 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 So it's like a whole set of symptoms yeah um any way 
I'm going to talk about. Well, mine's a part two. Right. If you remember, if think you remember, all the way back, think all the way back. A fortnight ago, I talked about Athalia Ponzel Lindsley. Right. Athalia Ponzel. Long story short, she was hacked with a machete <sighs> in yeah, that is... broad daylight on her front porch. The prime stu- suspect is a man named Alan Stanford. And Alan Stanford is the county commissioner of St. Augustine, Florida, where this happened. And Athalia and Alan had a, uh, definitely a feud, lots of government. Uh, he was in the government and she was trying to take him down. But it's not like she was um, not like she had any unfounded points or anything. She had brought up some legitimate stuff. So, um, if you want to recap, if you want to, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to go back an episode. Number right. one, number two, let's get started. So let's talk about the indictment. February 22nd, 1974, Sergeant Dominic Nicklow, special agent Dallas Herring and Sheriff Dudley Garrett arrested Alan Stanford for first degree murder. The Stanfords were a very popular and prominent family in St. Augustine. You know, he was county commissioner. Um, And I talked about this a little bit before. His salary was like way higher than all the other employees, which also made Athalia mad. And she had a lot to, she had a lot to talk about. People either, so when he was arrested, people either couldn't believe it or, um, or they were like, you know what? He's getting arrested and you know what? Athalia had it coming. Mm. Um, Some people were very. Oh yeah. You said some people were like nasty about it, right? Yeah, Athalia wasn't, um, it's 1974 and she spoke her mind. That's it. That's how I looked at it. She committed the crime of being an outspoken woman. Yeah. She was seen as intimidating and, um, rude and, (laughs) but she was also fought for what was right right and loved animals and just living her life. She just wanted to take care of animals. She was an opinionated woman. Let That's her bring great. her groceries in. God damn it. Person, right? um, okay. So, yeah, people either can be- believe it or Athalia simply had it coming. He, when he was arrested, he didn't portray any emotion when he, you know, um, he was arrested in front of, like, his family and, like, neighbors. Um, the And the media definitely favored him. It was basically impossible to have an unbiased trial mm. because of it. So, at his hearing, Ellen pleaded not guilty. Bail was set for $20,000 at first, but the judge, Judge Mathis, didn't set a bond at all and just let him go because there was actually a number of people who were ready to pay the amount to get him out of jail in the first place. Yeah, there were like people like, I'll pay the money. Um, Want to talk about a fucking unfair tragedy, the bail system, money bail? We're not going to get into that. We don't need to get into any of that. America loves punishing poor people. (laughs) Loves it. Um, Alan told the press that he barely knew Athalia and that he didn't even have much contact with her, which is not true. And the media printed all of that without really checking the facts. At the county commissioner meeting um, that, you know, Alan was usually the leader of, they unanimously, this at this point, you know, he's waiting release, they unanimously granted him an unpaid indefinite leave of absence instead of firing him. They're like, yeah, he'll be back someday, sometime. Beat your rep. We'll keep your seat warm for you. The prosecutor's case looked firm. Now, I talked about this um, a little bit last weekend, week, two weeks ago. It's your weekend. They had the murder weapon and clothing directly tied to both the crime scene and Alan. Alan's eyewitnesses weren't clear. The testimonies from his wife and daughter were terrible. They were very contradictory. Changed their story many times. They had a motive. And the blonde hairs found in the trousers were proven to be Athalia's. So let's talk about Alan's defense. 63-year-old Walter Arnold Jr., Alan Stanford's, quote, alpha lawyer, uh, was part of a prestigious law firm in Jacksonville, Florida. They ver- they rarely lost a case. Good joke, Wars. Um, joke, Wars. Father and, uh, or, uh, who am I talking about? Alan Stanford's father-in-law. Yes. Ended up paying for the steep fee mm. for, as Walter Arnold Jr. So not a cheap lawyer. I bet. And, like, despite Alan's 
like large salary. The family was really struggling financially. Um, the P- Patty, his wife, didn't work. Um, they, they, it was a really, it was, yeah. I don't think he would have gotten that lawyer without the payment from his father-in-law. Um, but the town was also very generous. The Trinity Episcopal Church fundraised money for uh, Alan and his family to live off of in the year preceding the trial. Um, Note that this place was super, super racist. Um, They didn't let black people in, period. No black people out of the church. Well, you know, I mean, it it wasn't 1978 yet, so God ain't changed his mind. Jesus fucking Christ. God damn it. (laughs) Right. I am a Mormon. Okay. (laughs) Uh, Walter Arnold uh, tried to get the evidence from the January 25th search warrant, which was some clothes, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. He tried to get all that evidence suppressed. He claimed that this search warrant violated Allen's constitutional rights. He said there was no probable cause. He claimed the affidavit doesn't describe the place to be searched, which is kind of true. Um, It didn't. I guess I guess um, affidavits have to be pretty specific. When it comes yes. to where you're going to search, it sure. didn't like sufficiently describe the entire property because some of the stuff was found in like the garage or like the backyard mm-hmm. and stuff like that. The prosecution tried to get the trial moved out of St. John's County, but the defense put in a rebuttal and wanted the trial to stay local. So usually the defense is the one who's like, hey, let's move this out of here. But in right. this case, the defense was like, yo, these people love Alan. So we need this to stay here. Um, And, you know, Alan was the straight up, he was the county commissioner. So, like, he had the public sympathy. Um, April 16th of 1974 was when the change of venue request was put through by uh, Assistant State Attorney Richard Watson. But there was a lot of media and there was a lot of publicity surrounding Athalia's murder in the first place. There was also a good amount of townspeople, like I said, donating to Allen's defense fund, making it difficult to find an unbiased jury. Eugene Eastmore, the official trial judge, took Richard Watson's change of venue request under advisement until the trial, believing that it was an impar- that like um, Walter Arnold Jr., uh, the defense lawyer, did a pretty good job convincing the judge that an in, that an impartial jury could be found. Um, that we can get a unbiased jury from this town right here, right now. Which I'm sure the judge he wants that to be the answer, right? He's like, well, it's easier. Yeah, I can be the judge, so you yeah. have to like do all this extra paperwork. I mean, just on a human level, he'd like he'd kind of rather just stay there. Exactly. The trial date was delayed several times, which helped the defense, you know, build their case and their tactics. The jury selection was slow, but the trial began exactly one year um, on the day of the murder, January 20th. It happened January 23rd, 1974. The trial began January 23rd, 1975. There, and here's another mystery besides well it's not really a mystery who did it but it's an official mystery that's what i like to say um spoiler alert he was acquitted mystery but um there aren't any court records for the trial they're gone we don't know what happened to them that's weird it's very weird so they weren't like sealed they're just like missing gone wow some speculate that it was never transcribed um and if it was it just disappeared we don't know we straight up period don't know All we know is what was published in the St. Augustine Record and the Florida Times Union. So the verdict of the jury had to be unanimous. That's why it was tough to pick a jury. Mm. Uh, State Attorney Stephen Boyles and Assistant State Attorney Richard Watson represented the prosecution. Frank Upchurch Jr. and partners Edward Booth and Walter Arnold um, from Jacksonville were representing Alan Stanford. According to interviews by... Eugene Eastmore, the judge, all jurors had knowledge of the events due to the media, but no one admitted prejudice. Uh, Friends and acquaintances of Alan Stanford were supposedly dismissed. So neither the defense or prosecution used all of their challenges either, which I don't really know. It's like kind of an interesting tidbit, but I don't know what to make of it, you know? Yeah. Um, There were... So the jury ended up being seven men, five women, and two alternates. Three were black, nine were white. 
there were tickets issued to the trial. Yes, there were tickets. It wasn't a large courtroom, um, but there were, it was full. Sally Boyles, the wife of the prosecutor, uh, went to the trial every day. Here's a quote from her. Quote, it was very intense. It was different than any ordinary trial because of the level of violence. There was just an undertone of violence at that trial. It was such a horrible and vicious trial. It was full of undercurrents of pressure on ed- ed- everyone. End quote. The defense objected to the use of the gruesome murder photos. So they showed the crime scene. They showed the photos, right. which is normal. That's what happens. Well, you have to know what happened. As I understand it, it's the the question is, it is is the probative value more than the prejudicial effect, right? So in essence, does it illuminate the crime more than it possibly just makes it look so horrible that they're right. going to say that of course this person did it and look how horrible it is? Right. Of course, the defense was like, "Oh, this is horrible. You can't show this. This is like." swaying the jury but it's um eastmore was like you know that's not up to the defense okay uh <laughs> i'm the judge these were keeping the photos so note that no fingerprints were taken at the crime scene and there was a lot of um slander in the media as well about how the crime scene itself was handled mm. um i know that it, the blood was washed away that guy testified right i remember you Jesus. saying that. yeah um the medical examiner, Dr. Schwartz, said that the cause of death death was almost complete decapitation. He said the main cause of death was a blow from the back of the head through the skull and neck bone and through a main artery. That's with a machete, folks. It would take a powerful person standing very close to right. the victim for this to happen. Uh, she also suffered a blow to the elbow that severed two and a half inches of bone and almost cut off her upper arm. The other, her other wrist, the right, right wrist was also in the same, sh- same shape. It was barely, it was like almost off, like hanging together by like tissue. She was nasty. Was severed fingers. Terrible. Absolutely. Absolutely gruesome. Machete attack. Like uh, Florida, Florida, period. Florida. Um, well, you said that's why it like kind of makes sense. Right. Cause there were it, a lot of machetes around. It was a machete attack and it wasn't like, Oh, a machete. Like we never see those here. No, right. there's, that's not a thing. Even the husband, even Athalia's husband had a, had a machete. It's not uncommon in certain countries, you know, in, um, I think it's like Bangladesh and Myanmar. Yeah. Like the, um, parts of India, I think it happens. Yeah. Like the, um, I don't remember exactly what it was called. The road and construction department, they had machetes Mm -hmm. to, you know, pave roads and chop through, kill snakes and tall grass in Florida. (laughs) Um, Lots of weird eyewitness testimonies, specifically those speaking on behalf of Alan. Employees for Alan couldn't remember, like, really easy details, like who they were working with that day. I don't remember. Lots of I don't remember. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. I don't recall. I do not specifically I don't think I was recall. there. Right. Blah, blah, blah. But they but they could remember pristinely that they saw Alan's car in the parking lot of his office between 5.30 and 6.30 p.m. They're like, yes. <laughs> yes. That is the one detail upon which we have all agreed when we got together to collude in our testimony. I'm not supposed to say this part. Shit. <laughs> in fact, Alan was specifically looking for people. Who saw his car in the parking lot between 5.30 and 6.30. He was, like, asking people, was like, hey, like, did you see my car at this time? (laughs) Did you? Because you did, right? You You did, did, didn't you? you saw it. Right? Um, The book, my my source was um, a book called Murder in St. Augustine, The Mysterious Death of Athalia Ponzel Lindsley by Elizabeth Randall. And it goes into, it really, really gets into the nitty gritty of the timelines. Mm -hmm. Um, I could have, I mean, I could have done all that, but it's kind of confusing yeah. um and a lot there's a lot of conflicting stories and a lot of the timeline timeline doesn't match up uh investigators even did like a a run through of what could what what alan said his path was and it didn't match uh he couldn't have gotten from this place to this place in 20 minutes blah 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 um there were time people logged in and out um of work and uh some employees who were like, yeah, I saw his car there. You clocked out at 
like 445 you weren't there stuff like that yeah like silly stuff like that um and and Alan was well aware that he was a suspect. He did an interview with the St. Augustine Record and talked about how he wishes the police would stop looking for him and start looking for the real perpetrator. Um, both Stanford's wife and daughter had also conflicting and unclear testimonies. So both of their names are Patricia. But uh, throughout the investigation, Patty is the wife. In the book, they said Patty Stanford's the wife and Patricia's the daughter. So Patty changed her story multiple multiple times. She first said that she was serving dinner when she heard the screams. In a second interview, she said it wasn't until after dinner that she heard the screams. And then in court, when she was asked to recount the story again, she said that she was in the hall when she heard the screams. Um, Patricia, the daughter, couldn't remember many things either, such as what time her mother got home, as well as what time her... She, don't, she doesn't remember when her father got home. She doesn't rem- really remember what he was wearing, probably. Yeah, I think he was wearing um, clothes. They were splattered with paint, this and the other thing. Um, note that Patty told Patricia... So, like, they heard the screaming, and they have the baby, Annette. I think I think she was one or two, um, their, their littlest daughter... Patty tells Patricia to, quote, go do something with the baby. I'm going to go check out what's going on out here. Like, mm-hmm. I hear screams like, what What the fuck is going on? Get the baby out of here. Um, Patricia took Annette outside in the backyard to swing. She didn't lock the bo- door behind her uh, while they were screaming in the neighbor's yard and possible killer on the loose. The prosecution was like, so let me get this right. You took you took a baby outside while there was somebody screaming outside and a possible killer was around? Is that what you did? Because <laughs> it doesn't really Because it doesn't sense. make sense. Note also that Ellen had the best motive for killing Athalia. She was actively trying she was actively trying to get him fired, really. And she wasn't ashamed about it. She went to those meetings all the time. I talked about this in the other episode as well. Uh she was there every meeting. Uh people testified in court that Athalia did actually fear for her life. Um there it was her sister that she confided in was like I think he I he threatened to kill me. Um Ellen also borrowed a machete from the town. Right. Right. So husband, uh, the husband, James Lindley, also had a machete. But his was too small, and they also had, it was accounted for. Uh Uh, The machete Ellen had borrowed was missing. The county kept an inventory, and they had no record of getting it back. Then there was the trail of blood leading from the murder scene to the wall of of Stanford's um, backyard. So there was also a drop of blood found on the signpost by the bridge, um, uh, by the office where Alan worked, as well as on the ground where Alan's parking space was. Eventually, and then we had our eyewitness, Locke McCormick, the 18-year-old neighbor. He eventually did recant his his eyewitness statement, but when he testified, he kind of stuck to the same general story. However, the defense really tore him down. Um, when he was cross-examined, he stammered. He became much more vague. Um, Walter Arnold objected to, like, the statement in general. He was like, this is hearsay. He can't go up there. Um, but he was How turned was down. How is it hearsay if he's talking about something he saw himself? Thank you. <laughs> <But sighs> yeah. What? So there was... there, and, and so at one point, the eyewitness statement was recanted. So there was a time in the investigation at this time about mid-February where there really wasn't much evidence against Allen, and it was difficult to arrest him. There was no murder weapon at one point. There was no clothing found, no eyewitness statement. Um, eventually, Allen stopped talking, too, um, unless Frank Upchurch, his, like, unofficial lawyer, was there, his, like, advisor, basically. Um, a few days after the murder, a search warrant was granted to search Allen Stanford's home. Now, this is the this was January 25th. I talked about this a little bit earlier when... St- the lawyer, Walter Arnold, tried to get this evidence taken out. So they found sneakers in the dryer. They found um, blood on concrete blocks and a shovel. Uh, There was no bloody clothing specifically tied to Allen at this point or a murder weapon at this point. Um, They even drained the Maria Sanchez Lake, hoping to find the murder weapon, but they never found it. There was an award for $500 that was advertised for anyone who came forward um, with information that led to the murder weapon. It was... it So, 
this reward, reward was put out. $500 to anybody who found, finds the murder weapon. A day uh-huh. later, it was found. Oh, wow. Um, Effective. The, uh, yeah. The man who found it, a man named Dewey Lee, um, town alcoholic, rather untrustworthy. Word was the weapon was given to him by the husband, James Lindsley. Mm. Um, and he did, in fact, get the money. He called it his machete money. Uh, however, Dewey Lee was kind of a scavenger. He was always going through dumps and garbage bins. He was always looking for car parts, looking for any scraps, anything useful. It was something that he did. So it, him finding it wasn't a surprise because he was, he did see it and was like, I'm going to start looking for it. Like, just, I'm going to keep an eye out for it. In his deposition, he said he he was actively looking for it. And then um, he decided it had to be somewhere out of the way. And he, like I said, he ended up finding it, finding it, him and his friend, Eddie Lightsey. So they found it in a marsh or like this weird body of water that's used as a dump a few miles from Marine Street. It was a, they found that rusty machete in um, a pile of mud wrapped and wrapped in a towel. And in the towel was a Hamilton wristwatch stained with blood, dark blue pants and white shirt also covered in blood, a baby diaper with blue paint on it, a belt, a tie, and blonde hair was found on both the trousers trousers and the machete. The evidence was sealed up and sent to a lab in Tallahassee. Uh, through bank records, police found that the trousers were bought by Patricia Stanford at a nearby clothing store. They even um, got a deposition from the tailor who was there proving that the clothes were Allen's. And he's like, yeah, like, I remember this pattern and, like, selling it to Patricia and sizing yeah. it for Allen and this and the other thing. Um they proved that the blue paint found in the diaper matched exactly to a brand of paint Allen purchased two years prior at the Sherwin Williams. Um, also found, and he bought it with a credit card, so they looked through billing statements and stuff like that. After two hours of deliberation, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty. Uh, Allen Stanford was officially acquitted of the murder of Athalia Ponzel Lindsley. Your face right now describes everything. I mean, I obviously knew it was coming. I mean, you literally said it earlier, but it's somehow still surprising. It's, um, it's, it, I think for me, it was the jury. Yeah. The, it was the, if it was moved, I think if the trial was moved, it would have gone better. But there was a lot of media, a lot of publicity surrounding it. Sure. Alan was the powerful white dude, um, it was, there was a lot of evidence, but also Walter Arnold Jr. didn't lose a case. He did a lot of um, meticulous study and lots of calling out things like, that's not right, and um, stuff like that. Yeah. In he several, did a lot of questioning. Yeah. In, in in several ways, this reminds me of the one I recently did, the, the you know, investor murders, Craig Alaska. They, right. You know, yeah. murder people on the, the burned up boat. Um, the timeline being super convoluted yes. and totally disputed, right? Exactly. The basic timeline is totally disputed. Um, and there's reasonable doubt there. And and there's and the excellent defense attorney was able to create just enough, you know, reasonable doubt. Exactly. Um, you know, for it to happen. But of course, the big difference there is there was a change of venue for the second trial. Um, so um, maybe that you know. I mean, obviously, it didn't make the difference because he was acquitted again. But yeah. uh, anyway, go on. Um, so, yes, he was acquitted. A month later, he was fired from his job as county commissioner. Mm. And then he eventually moved out of town. Wow. So so he lo- in the end, he lost his job. If he did do it, it did not work. He's walking, walked a free man. I guess so. So let's talk about the second attack. The... Okay. So 10 months after Athalia's murder, 76-year-old Francis Bemis, an acquaintance and neighbor of Athalia, was murdered. She had a lot of friends and interests. She was really into visual art. She was a professional writer. She didn't have any enemies. Gossip connected the two murders. Maybe she knew something. Apparently, Francis was writing a book that detailed what actually happened and that allegedly there was another eyewitness. Um, But this is gossip. This is hearsay. Mm. People thought that she knew something. She, um, and she was a writer. She wrote op-eds throughout her life, but she never wrote or published anything about the murder. Um, 
her 80-year-old neighbor, Kathleen Shropshire, made a formal statement saying that during Frances' nightly walks, and she went on a walk every night, uh, Frances would often visit her to come chat. And one night, she said that she was sure Alan Stanford had killed Athalia and that, quote, knows a man who knows something. I'm trying to get him, I'm trying to, get him to go to the law, end quote. Mm. Um, she was never subpoenaed in the trial. She didn't like Alan. Um, and both women had a lot in, in common. They were both outspoken, educated. They advocated for animals. Frances protested against the use of uh, horses and carriages throughout the town. Neither of them bared children, but they loved their nieces. Both had made and started their careers in New York. So um, Frances Bemis moved to New York City in the 20s to pursue work in advertising and public relations. She was a socialite a, and a great writer. And in 1943, she enlisted in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Corps? Core. Core. Ha ha. Yes, that's what I said the first time, the first time. <laughs> and was stationed in Daytona Beach. She actually coordinated, like, the entertainment events for the USO, the United Service Organization. Oh, cool. Yeah. In 58, she moved to St. Augustine and continued to host social events in town and retired. Um, it was on her nightly walk, November 3rd, 1974, that Frances Bemis was murdered. She went out on her walk. Wait, 1974? I thought this was after the trial and everything. No, this was not after the trial. This was oh. 10 months after the murder. Oh, wow. So this yeah. was before the trial. This was before the trial. This oh. Was, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. This was when... This was the... He was... Uh, Alan was in, officially indicted, like, late February of 74. So I this know. is, like, so getting the before. jury together, um, getting, hmm. you know... Okay. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Um, no, it was kind of confusing. So November, 1974. Um, so quick timeline. Athalia was murdered in January of 74. Um, what's his face indicted in February of 74. February of 74. No, she was killed in January of 74. And what's his face indicted in late February of 74. Francis was murdered in November of 74. Okay. Um, so her, she, Okay. Her skull was crushed by a cement block. One eye was gouged. Her face was smashed. She was unrecognizable. Almost every bone in her body was broken. There was singeing on her legs. Someone had tried to burn the body. Found nearly nude, but there was no sign of rape. She never carried a purse during her walk, so it wasn't a robbery. Neighbors said that they heard screams. One neighbor said that she did call the police, and the police went out, but they didn't find anything. They didn't look that hard. They didn't even check in with the person who called. Um, on the morning of November 4th, uh, her body was found in a vacant lot south of where she lived. Evidence collected uh, included ashes, the cloth used to cover the body, pieces of a cement block, a key, pearls, a flashlight, denim cloth, and her disheveled clothes. The body was so mangled that she wasn't identified for a week until the dental records came through. Most people knew that it was her, but it wasn't official until later. Mm -hmm. Um, and just like Athalia's murder, the county police and local office investigated, um, together. They had to work together on this one. So, um, they made up a list of sex offend offenders and mental patients, interviewed recent assault victims, interviewed men who had been recently released from jail, um, anybody with a record, the brown hair that was found as well as the denim cloth found did not belong to her and didn't reveal any results. A man named Gerald Austin was identified as a sub suspect in the FBI report. There wasn't much info about him except that he lived nearby, and he wasn't identified anywhere else except for the FBI report, which is kind of weird. Um, and Alan Sanford was also listed as a suspect, but he was more listed as a suspect logically, right. and the police didn't think that Alan killed her because he was lying low and waiting for his trial. He didn't. It didn't make sense for him to kill a random woman because of rumors and gossip. She might know something. She right. might be writing an expose. Like, well, I don't know. Um, there was a reward put up, but no one came forward. Um, they really couldn't figure out the motive or why she had been targeted. She was outspoken, but she was tender and she was sweet. The The murder seemed opportunistic instead of, like, careful and, and planned. Mm -hmm. But, um... To this day, the murder of Francis Bemis is unsolved, as mm. is officially the murder of Athalia Ponzel Lindsley. Right. And that is the story. I see. You see? You I mean, see. Now yeah. you'll see. Yeah. Mario, do you have any... 
weird yeah, shit in the, in the news? Weird shit in the news? I do, in fact. Because we looked for some before we started. Um, so my, mine's from the AP Odd News page. Oddities. Oddities. And uh, the headline is, Alaska University taking PBNJ as payment for parking tickets. Uh, Sorry, par- what? I know, right? Um, apparently this is a um, sort of a yearly tradition um, oh. at the University of Alaska Anchorage campus. And uh, they actually do it for a good reason. They say that they're taking donations as, a, as payment um, for the parking tickets and, and giving them to students in need. Okay, um, yeah. In need of food. In, ho- you know, combating student hunger is how yeah. they put it. So, uh, yeah, you know, if you go to, uh, you know, U-, U of A-A or whatever the fuck they call it, um, you can, you know, just get a, get a parking ticket. Donate a PB&J. Get a parking ticket intentionally. That's what I'd say. Two a month. Um, that's, <laughs> it, that's what they say. Or within 45 days or something. I don't know. Um, yeah. It's a pretty good deal. It's pretty solid. Any kind of jam, jelly, marmalade, or preservatives will be accepted. Thank you. <laughs> and different kinds of butter too, just not not just peanut butter. So oh. that's what, that's what weird shit. Almond so, butter, kind of a good weird shit. So um, I have weird shit. Good Mine's for not you. good. Well, it's it's fascinating. It's on the topic of murder. Um, so this is an article from the Guardian, um, from about five days ago or so. the 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 title is Alexa. Did he do it? Smart device could be witness in suspicious Florida death. I heard about this. Florida. So, the woman's name is Sylvia Galva Crespo, and she was killed by a spear to the chest. Uh, what? Yes. So, um, they they think that Alexa might have heard something. So, the the speaker uh, has a like awake word mm-hmm. that used to activate them, and it's possible that. Alexa may have heard and recorded something relevant during the the murder. So it was um, Adam Crespo, who is the, I think he's the boyfriend or the husband, question mark? The lover, Adam Crespo. He was charged with second degree murder. Um, and they did receive courtings and uh, they're in the process of analyzing the info. Wow. Yeah. But, uh, this was the murder happened back in July, and they're investigating. She was bleeding profusely. Um, Adam Crespo quote Adam Crespo said the spear had snapped during the altercation, and the twelve inch blade had somehow pierced his wife's chest. He pulled the blade out, hoping it was not too bad, but she died. End quote. Wow, how fucked is that? That's uh, quite an unbelievable explanation. Yeah, they were arguing, and that's what happened. I see. Um, but, yeah, they do have a certain capacity to eavesdrop in some mm. circumstances, and it's, it's, it's not the first time that Alexa or Google has come in, up in criminal cases before. No, definitely. Um, but the case continues, and that article was written by... Someone at the Guardian. It just says Guardian staff and agencies. Probably a British person. Is the Guardian British? It's uh, It's got a U.S. branch as well. Thanks for listening, y'all. Thank you for listening to us talk about mysteries and yes. murderies and thingies. And um, we, we try to, you know, talk about important stuff and not always the easiest to talk about, but right. mixing in some levity and humor, too. So I, yeah. I hope this episode wasn't too hard to get through. Um, but anyway, fo- follow us on the internet. Twitter, Facebook, um, Twitter. Instagram. Right, the Instagram. And, um, you can be my peanut butter, I can be your jam. Mario you should 30. go follow me on Instagram. Hey, eh, eh, eh. Sorry, what? That's okay. Um, <laughs> I think we're done. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay bye. bye. <laughs>